it's that question that's posed in the in the department store at this time of year, would you like that gift, gift wrapped? And the same question arises now in relation to DAOs as well, would you like that DAO wrapped? Which is effectively the question of whether or not um, you want some sort of legal structure uh, within your DAO or around your DAO in order to protect individuals who are participating in the DAO from liability. Um, there's obviously a number of advantages and disadvantages to imposing a legal structure around a DAO and some would say that it's contrary to the very nature and idea of why DAOs um, have been brought into existence to put a wrapper around it. But um, I suppose being the lawyer in the room, the caution that I suppose I would add is that if you don't select the vehicle for your DAO, then someone might come along and select that legal vehicle for you. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, this morning. Um, we're still at the very early stage of DAOs, I think as some of the other speakers have mentioned, and we're at the very, very early stage of exploring what legal liability for DAOs look like. Um, but there are some, uh, there have been a few cases this year in the United States that have started to explore this issue. And there's some, there's some insights that we can glean about how courts and regulators are starting to think about the liability of DAOs. Um, one thing I would say is that, uh, at least at this early stage, and these are not necessarily textbook or good examples, but um, the idea that uh, you, you can stand behind the it's autonomous smart contracts type defence, um, there's some risk around that, um, which is revealed by these three cases that I'll talk about. So Tornado Cash, um, most of you I think in this room will probably be aware of Tornado Cash, um, which was a mixing service on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, in August this year, OFAC, which is the US Treasury Sanctions Office, sanctioned Tornado Cash, whatever Tornado Cash is, uh, and listed the ULR and various wallet addresses on the SDN list. A couple of days later, the Dutch authorities arrested a developer in relation to his work on the Tornado Cash protocol called Alexei Pertsev. Um, this caused, as many of you will know, uh, an uproar in the, the crypto community um, and certainly um, has led to some debate and legal action by the likes of Coin Center, for example, in the United States, who have disputed OFAC's authority to sanction Tornado Cash on the basis that it's software and, and not an entity. Um, that action by Coin Center, uh, we think, led to OFAC's decision in November to actually redesignate Tornado Cash on the sanctions list and also to uh, give some colour to what it thinks uh, Tornado Cash is exactly, whether that's an entity or something else. Interestingly, they haven't pinned their colours to the mast in terms of saying exactly we think it is, for example, a partnership or an unincorporated association. They merely say in their FAQs online that it is a partnership association, joint venture, corporation, group, subgroup or other organisation unspecified, um, which is quite quite interesting and, and, and it is the first example we've seen of a DAO um, being sanctioned. So quite interesting for that reason, along with many other reasons as well. I won't get into the um, all of the, the privacy related issues relating to Tornado Cash for the purpose of this talk, just um, focusing purely on the liability type questions. But um, what we're seeing here is uh, effectively OFAC looking through the Tornado Cash structure and saying, we think there's a structure there that we can sanction um, without specifying exactly what that is. And then in parallel, you have the Dutch authorities uh, going after particular individuals who they claim were in the so-called driver's seat representing Team Tornado Cash and effectively operating it uh, as if it was a business. Now, those are all allegations at this stage and much will probably come out, I suspect, in those Dutch proceedings over the next uh, couple of years, but it'll be certainly interesting to watch. Um, the second case is Uki Dow. Now, Uki Dao, again, is perhaps not a textbook example of decentralisation, um, but uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, there was a, a protocol called B0X, um, which was the predecessor of Uki Dao. And at some point in 2021, uh, the founders of B0X tr effect effectively tried to transition the business into a Dao by handing it over to the community, um, uh, so that as they described it. Now, the CFTC, which is the principal commodities uh, regulation body in the US, uh, pursued the founders of B0X and ultimately reached a settlement with them for operating an unregistered uh, futures exchange and KYC failings. But the, the interesting part about this is that they then attempted to go after the DAO itself, which they've labelled an unincorporated association. 
and in and this is uh, depends on which jurisdiction you're talking about. But in the U.S. context, that ha carries with it potential liability for the token for the token holders themselves as uh, members of the members of the DAO. At least at least so the CFTC claim. Um, they've not formally joined individual token holders to that action. Although the relief that they're seeking would include injunctions against the uh, the DAO members and potentially the DAO members themselves may be liable. The other interesting aspect of it is that they've specifically cited voting token holders, so active participants in the DAO, which raises interesting questions in and of itself. Um, the other interesting aspect of this um, action by the CFTC is that there was actually a very strong dissent from Commissioner Mersinger, who is uh, one of the, the CFTC's uh, commissioners looking at this case um, objecting to the regulation by enforcement type approach by the CFTC of not relying on any sort of established principles or guidelines, but saying we think this is an unincorporated association and everyone who voted in the DAO is therefore potentially liable for its actions, which she described as arbitrary and certainly is a novel application of the law. Um, how this will all play out is very interesting. There's been all sorts of disputes about how to serve Uki Dao and how to and whether individual members of the Dao should be served and how they should be served, and um, a lot of uh, industry organisations as well weighing in on the appropriateness of this particular action. But it's likely to set um, some form of legal uh, precedent around these sorts of issues, and will certainly be one to watch. I think the the, the really interesting question is who, who, if this is an unincorporated association, who forms part of that? And certainly, for my part, the the idea that voting token holders um, would arbitrarily be selected as that group of people um, without reference to any particular decisions that were made, I think is quite an interesting um, approach from, from the regulator and a bit worrying. Uh, the third case is the American Crypto Fed Dow case, which has just only recently kicked off, so where the SEC is basically trying to stop a securities offering by American Crypto Fed. Now, American Crypto Fed claims to be the first Wyoming registered DAO, and uh, it is engaged in a, in a stablecoin project. Um, I won't get into any sort of views on the legitimacy or otherwise of that project or um, the merits of it, but it, interestingly, they attempted to file an S1, which is basically a securities filing in the US to in, in preparation for an offering, which the SEC is now trying to stop by effectively injuncting, injuncting the DAO itself, which is the first instance that we're aware of of a, of a DAO actually being subject to those, that, that sort of action. So just to contrast those uh, cases very briefly, you've got Tornado Cash, no DAO wrapper, a, 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 a sanctioned entity, however you define what that entity is, and then developers being prosecuted. Uki Dao, again, no wrapper, um, interesting transition from a, a legal entity to a DAO um, with some question marks around it. Uh, an unincorporated association, so the CFTC claim with token holders potentially being liable for its debts. Then you've got American Crypto Fed, which is a legally wrapped Wyoming DAO, which has been the subject of action. Now, this is all pretty anecdotal at this stage in terms of looking at who, where liability is attaching, but you can see how the regulators uh, taking these novel structures and applying their own lens over it and saying this is how we think it works and this is how we think it's going to be liable. And so the choice effectively for those people who are engaged in that has been taken out of out of their hands. Um, the other interesting feature obviously is decentralisation. Now, decentralisation is not something we have a lot of case law around in Australia at this point, but whether that would be an effective defence or not, I think is an interesting, interesting question which will remain to be determined and might come up in the Uki Dow case. Uh, just to finish off briefly, um, there are a lot of different models out there for what DAOs look like. Some are taking the, the unincorporated approach, others are operating through different corporate structures. We now have statutory recognition in three US states as well as the Marshall Islands. Um, I, I think it's still relatively early days in terms of how, how those regimes are working and whether they're, they're effective and, and cases like the American Crypto Fed one I'm sure will inform some thoughts around those regimes. Uh, in Australia, for those who aren't, aren't from Australia, there was a report last, a Senate report last year that Australia recommended Australia should explore statutory recognition of DAOs. And I know there's been some great discussions this week around 
what that law might look like. Um, it's certainly something that we think has um, promise around it in terms of creating uh, non-hierarchical uh, structures that allow individuals who don't necessarily know each other to interact in, in new ways. I think there's a lot of questions around what that actually looks like and how you insulate people from, from liability, but it's certainly um, a lot of promise there and something that I'm very happy to, to talk more about. So thank you. Next speaker for this session is Lachlan Robb from QUT uh, from the Law School. Some slides. There should be slides. There we go. Hi, so um, I'm Lachlan Robb. I'm a lecturer at QUT in the Law School, where I conduct research into technology, law, and specifically blockchain. Uh, for my research, I conducted an ethnography. For those unfamiliar, this is something that basically places the researcher as something akin to an anthropologist. Imagine an academic type going to visit some tropical islands to study the people for 10 years and write books, etc. That's what I did, but the tribe I followed was Beef Ledger. They're a Brisbane-based company developing a blockchain system that looked at beef and cattle exports. So I spent six months intensely working with them, sitting in the back corner or helping out where I could. I even followed the team over to China in November 2019 before the world all shut down. I needed to be involved enough to understand what was happening, but not so far ingrained that I changed or guided the actions of the people I was observing. Today I want to talk to you about some of the stories that I found, some of which may indeed be a tad familiar to some of you, but I'm hoping that some of the ideas I raise are a bit of a unique way to look at these things. A challenge with law and technology is the interaction between tech startups and lawyers. All too often, a lawyer is seen as an unnecessary cost or simply the person in the suit that says no. But what my research helps reveal were the ways that coders and lawyers may not actually be all that different. Because of concepts like technological management, Coders may be taking on more and more ad hoc regulatory roles in society, especially when using blockchain. Law needs to be appreciated as an expression of humanity, order, and time. That law and legal apparatuses exist because we as humans want to create structural certainty about our future, and that through certain structures, norms, and traditions, we can begin to actually set the future in a way that we can plan forward with our lives. It's about acting in the present to have some certainty into the future. The work of lawyers or law work can be seen as this type of action. This is seen within Hobbes's concept of prudence, which is expressible as a presumption of future contracted from the experience of past time. This in its simplest form means that we as a society should be able to decide what to do, how to act, how to engage with the law, because we know based on these past actions, how the future will respond to our current actions. This has been broken down further into three qualities, a clear concern with the present, an expressed desire to fix these problems and concerns, and confidence that the tools being used now will actually be able to reach into the future to give that order and structure. These qualities are clearly expressed through my observations of Beef Ledger as a blockchain entrepreneurial project. The first element of clear concern, this is within the aims and aspirations of the coders and entrepreneurs. They had a concern about what was happening now, this is seen more than just the promise of decentralized currencies or economic arguments, but of bigger problems seen in the world. For that project, they looked mostly at issues of food fraud, as well as trust in this export system. Those were problems that were happening in the moment. Number two, they expressed a desire to fix this. They were standing forward and screaming loudly that their blockchain was a solution, that they can or even must be the ones that actually had the solution here. And it's not a matter of overconfidence or hubris, but often just recognizing that they actually have tools to do something, to choose that human aspect of technology sometimes. And finally, the coders had a clear confidence that the blockchain and their solutions could actually reach forward, create a strong, unbroken chain, and that that gives stability needed to move forward. Through my research, the blockchain entrepreneurs I observed did indeed have a vision of the future where the real and the digital are things that work together to make life less problematic. 
They were consciously trying to build something that reaches forward in time to render it coherent. That's the normative ordering. They wanted to build a brave new world, and yes, it was something that could be sold and commercialized. And these expressions and belief, though, have typically been observed in that utopian ideal we have in Web3. And it's simply built on ideas of how people will interact into the future within that system. And to that end, I argue that coders engage in that action of law work. They're creating certainty in the future, but with the tools of technology and blockchain, not rules, legislation, and the backing of the state. So in that way, perhaps coders and lawyers are not so different. But why does it matter? Is it simply more than trying to just get these two groups to stop seeing each other as a villain, but rather to try and point out a few, let's say, unintended consequences that arise from this evolving state of affairs? And to do that, let's look back to the nature of blockchain. Blockchain has a common quant quality definable as technological management. This means that blockchain is both the subject of regulation, you know, there's a need to regulate how the technology is used, and it's a tool of regulation. It's something that can self-regulate other actions. Because it is code, it is restrictive. It can allow things to either happen or not. You can either upload something or not. It's like a car where it can literally be driven anywhere, limited only by terrain or gravity, but instead code like blockchain is capable of restricting actions. This idea of technical management is explained by theorist Brownsword through an example of geologging golf carts. If a golf club owner wants to bring in golf carts, they may make a rule that says no carts on the greens. This can be followed by those who know the owner and respect them. It is a social rule almost. But as the club grows, they're going to get more people who don't necessarily respect in the same way. As such, there needs to be a clear rule or maybe even some tech to enforce it, cameras, people, monitoring, but these can all be exploited. Eventually, the owner decides to use geo-locking golf carts. These physically cannot go beyond the program limits, and so they cannot be brought onto the greens. And this is great, except it's a very binary application of the rule. What happens if there's an emergency? What happens if one of the golfers injures themselves while on the green? It sure would be convenient to bring the cart right up to them, but you can't. In this instance, the owner has unilaterally decided how objects are to be used and has used technology to enforce it. They have stepped into the shoes of a regulator of sorts, and it is something binary and not able to adapt to emergency decision easily. Or as HLA Hart would put it, it cannot deal with the penumbra of decision making. Technology such as blockchain can enforce rules as architecture, to adopt Lessig's phrase, and this means that code is the law in this instance. And so the code will continue regardless of one's knowledge or input in the same way that we cannot stop gravity from acting upon us, nor can we threaten an ATM with violence in the same way that a robber could threaten a real life teller. This means that as technology increases, states, companies, and individuals are going to be getting technology that can actually allow for technological management to be used in ever increasing volumes. In the same way that people are waking up to issues around data and cybersecurity, so too should be aware of the ways that these forms of technological management can be used, abused, and inadvertently misused. And especially when we look at the power it places in the hands of coders, that the coders may not actually be aware that they have. Entrepreneurs, including those developing blockchain, fall into the same desire to create that certainty into the future by creating structures in the present. While they're using a different tool, a different type of code, coders, developers, and digital entrepreneurs are still a type of profession responding to those same types of human needs. This is manifestation of the human tradition of creating society, order, and plans, but one that embraces the modern expressions of technology and tools. In this sense, coding captures these deeper functionalities that we ascribe to law when seeing this through the effect of technological management. In the technology can operate as a restrictive force, even accidentally, and it changes the nature of how we see those developing the technology. I have no solution for this, except to try and spread some awareness, to encourage people to think of the law before they get to the beta phase, and to try and avoid, let's say, exploiting too many loopholes, because that is a surefire way to make sure that traditional regulators pay attention. And that's all from me.
Kushnir. Alana Kushnir is, um, she has her own practice. She's also a lawyer, an arts lawyer. Her practice is guest work agency. I had the absolute privilege this year of working quite closely with Alana on a report for the Australia Council for the Arts, uh, where we looked at some of the legal conundrums surrounding NFTs in particular. And I've asked her to speak today on the specific issue of resale royalties in Australia. Thanks, Ellie, and thank you to the RMIT blockchain team. It's been a pleasure to collaborate with you so far. Um, so one of the less talked about types of regulation which already interacts with Web3 projects that involve NFTs and particularly NFT artworks are the laws around resale royalties and the administration of payments of those royalties. So as Ali prefaced, my talk today will consider the resale royalty landscape of NFTs, and I'm going to use the Australian resale royalty regulations as a uh, case study. And uh, yes, as Ellie mentioned, a short form of this uh, research was published as part of the paper commissioned by the Australia Council of, for the Arts and prepared by the blockchain in an RMIT blockchain innovation hub, um, developments in Web3 for the creative industries. Um, and the report was authored by Ellie, Rennie, Indigo, Holcomb, James, with contributions from Tim Webster and Benjamin Morgan, as well as myself. So just by way of background, There you go. Um, so just by way of background, one of the common uh, reasons, or I'd say the most common reasons NFTs have been championed as changing the status quo for creators is because of their ability to distribute royalties to the creator or creators where uh, or when the NFT is resold. But we've also seen, um, you know, a more recent discourse in the crypto community around the payment of royalties to creators and whether platforms should have the right to block transactions which do not pay royalties. Um, but what's really not discussed within this current discourse is how existing resale royalties laws and regulations impact on who should be paid royalties from a legal perspective and how those legally enforceable royalty requirements are administered in practice. And so some jurisdictions that don't um, currently legislate for an artist's resale, or I should say some jurisdictions that do currently re legislate for an artist's resale royalty or um, draw de suite uh, laws that were first brought into effect in France more than 100 years ago. And since then, we've had um, more than 75 countries who have followed suit, um, propelled by the endorsement of Article 14 TR of the Berne Convention and then the European Parliament Directive um, in, in 2001. So notwithstanding this widespread adoption of resale royalty laws, um, the components and the mechanics of each of these legislative schemes uh, varies quite significantly. So, for example, a royalty rate of 5% of the total resale price is required in Australia, whereas in Brazil, the royalty rate is set at 5% of any gain in the value of an artwork once it's sold. And so in EU countries, also the royalty rate depends or varies depending on the sale price of the work. So each jurisdiction um, has these different thresholds for the minimum sale price, which triggers the payment of a resale royalty as well. Uh, but having a closer look at the Australian resale royalty legislation, which was first introduced 12 years ago in 2010, and so the Act establishes this right, a legal right to receive a resale royalty on the commercial resale of an artwork. And as mentioned, that amount of the resale royalty is set at 5% of the sale price. Um, so what is an artwork when it comes to resale royalty legislation in Australia? Uh, it's quite a broad 
definition of an artwork, at least when in the eyes of the law, um, is defined as an original work of visual art, and it includes this non-exhaustive um, list of different types of works of visual art. And so as you can see on the slides, it includes digital artworks, um, and it also includes multimedia artworks, um, as well as um, photographs, pictures, videos, um, and uh, so you could probably see where I'm going with this in that potentially it could cover NFTs that are, are linked to video artworks or, or images as well. Um, so the right is granted to uh, creators who are living and to beneficiaries of artists who are no longer living, so up to 70 years after uh, their death, um, where the artist has to satisfy the residency test at the time of the resale. And um, the residency test under the Australian legislation is, again, very broad. It doesn't only capture Australian citizens and permanent residents of Australia. It also captures a national or citizen of a country prescribed as a reciprocating um, country. So again, the kind of the, the remit of this legislation uh, and who it might affect is, is broad. Sorry, that was probably me. <laughs> I don't know if you can get that back up. Okay, so what are the consequences of breaching this legislation? So section 20 of the act tells us that um, the seller and the seller's agent or art market professional are jointly and severally liable. Um, and this section also provides that if there's no agent for the seller, the buyer's agent acting as art market professional is liable, or if there are no agents for either seller or buyer, then it's the buyer that is liable. Um, and in terms of administration, under the Act, the federal government has appointed the Copyright Agency, which is an independent, not-for-profit organisation, to act as um, the collecting society for these royalties. And um, for those who aren't familiar with the, the role of the Copyright Agency, the Copyright Agency also has within its remits to um, administer um, licensing royalties for, for copyright works as well. And so under the resale royalty legislation, the Copyright Agency needs to use best endeavours to collect the resale royalties payable under the Act, um, and if necessary, enforce any resale royalty right held under the Act um, on behalf of the holder or holders of the resale royalty right. Um, this scheme also requires the seller or the seller's agent to report all resales to the copyright agency unless the price paid for an artwork is less than the threshold of $1,000 AUD or the sale is a what's described as a private sale between individuals when no art market professional is involved. Um, so yes, as I flagged, currently it's unclear whether the resale of NFTs created by at least Australian artists triggers the application of these resale royalty laws and whether the resale of NFTs must be reported to the copyright agency under the scheme. And the reason we have this ambiguity is partly because of the terminology that's used in the Act and also partly because this terminology has never been um, argued about in, in a court of law in Australia as well. So we have no court guidance on the interpretation of um, certain wording within this, this legislation. Um, of course, you know, if you think about it, this Act came into play in 2010, so it was drafted with more traditional forms of marketplaces for art in mind, like auction houses and, and galleries. Um, but I'd say there's two, two particular um, phrases or terms in, in the legislation that, that are um, not clear and, and problematic uh, because of that, and that is the terms commercial resale and also art market professional. Um, so you can see section eight on, on the slides here. And so you can see that 
a commercial resale of an artwork um, is essentially defined as a form of ownership transferred from one person to another for monetary consideration. Um, and again, here the continuation of Section 8, you can see that um, there are certain classes of transfers of ownership that are excluded, um, but it also has a list of, you know, who would be captured under the phrase art market professional. Um, so you've got an auctioneer, you've got an art dealer, uh, but most importantly, I wanted to draw your attention to, to this last category, which is a person otherwise involved in the business of dealing in art works. Um, so if you look at the, there's actually some re uh, regulations that have come into play. I'll just skip to those. Uh, actually, yeah, some regulations that have come into play, which um, don't give us much of an indication of how these terms are going to be interpreted. Um, you can also look to the explanatory me memorandum, which um, lawyers tend to do, where there's not much guidance in, in the Act. Um, and so, again, we don't see much guidance here around monetary consideration, but it is possible that it could be interpreted to mean transfers of ownership for consideration in the form of cryptocurrency. Um, the other point, interesting point to note with the explanatory memorandum is how it describes an art market professional. Um, and again, this, uh, the explanatory memorandum seems to suggest quite a broad definition of an art market professional. Um, so onto this point of person otherwise in the business of dealing in artworks, it covers commercial operators whose primary business is not dealing in artworks, but who engage in the business of selling artwork on a regular basis. So they use the example of a cafe owner who regularly displays art for sale on the cafe walls or a specialist antique dealer who regularly deals in a mixture of artworks and um, furniture. So query whether this would capture NFT um, platforms or, you know, even broader than NFT platforms, any type of online um, marketplace where there's a commercial resale of an artwork that's involved. Um, just onto the reporting point, just to flag. So on the Copyright Agency website, you can actually see a, all, a list of all of the um, resold artworks that have been reported to the Copyright Agency. Um, but as part of my research, we, I did do a review of all the publicly available notice of resale records, um, and there are no NFT sales uh, reported or identified at all. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so just to finish off, so where to from here? Where do these uncertainties around the interaction of the legislation and the resale royalty scheme leave Australian artists who are creators of NFTs? Um, Last year, the beginning of last year, the Copyright Agency did publicly express their commitment to engaging with, um, and I quote, all visual arts blockchain organisations. They had this statement that was published on their website, um, but that's pretty much the extent of how vocal the Copyright Agency has been around the application of the legislation to the, uh, to, to, to the sale or resale, I should say, of NFTs. Um, I think what's most concerning is that the research that was conducted as part of the What's Happening in Web3 paper shows that Australian artists have been paid royalties for NFTs by NFT platforms and marketplaces, um, but none of the artists that were interviewed had any interaction with the copyright agency or the scheme to date. Um, and nor is it clear whether Australian-owned NFT platforms or marketplaces have contemplated their reporting obligations, let alone liabilities under the Act. Um, so just a few issues that need some timely attention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we can bring up Teams, if Mike Pacino is on there. Thank you. I am. And G'day. are you there? Hello. Welcome. <laughs> nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. Um, let's take the slides down now so we can have him on the big screen because don't you just love having your, <laughs> your face blasted across the walls of a theatre? Um, so we're into Q&A, but um, Mike, I mean, is there anything that you wanted to add to anything that's been said just um, 
why we have you here right now. Oh, I think the speaker's covered off everything quite well, so we could jump straight into Q&A. Okay, Q&A. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I have one first, which is, um, I think, kind of to Alana and Lachlan, perhaps, which is that the, if, if I mean, I think what Alana's described is a, an instance where the um, uh, kind of uh, laws are being made by coders, <laughs> in a way, in the way that Lachlan's described. But there's also uh, a suite of other actors involved in the arts industry, as you've suggested, such as galleries who would, say, administer resale royalties on behalf of artists in many instances. So how, you know, I mean, what, what kind of scope and role is there for these, uh, rather than saying this is something that is always uh, in the hands of artists and self-custody, but, but how do we kind of bring along all the various parts of a system to come into alignment or to ensure that, you know, the old rules and the new rules are well aligned and operating effectively? I guess what I've learned is through this research is that there are not many artists that in Australia that are actually even aware of this legislation, or at least artists who, you know, haven't had much involvement in the past in the traditional art market of working with galleries and working with auction houses. So, um, yes, this lack of awareness of this piece of legislation that may very well apply to them and, and works of theirs or NFT artworks that they put out there, you know, is quite um concerning to me but so in terms of you know what could be done I, I i it also you know i guess is concerning that the copyright agency has really stayed silent over the last year and a half in a space and mm. doesn't seem to be much movement there at all yeah although you know i, I spoke to them a few years ago when they were yes. trying to do a kind of uh, ledger-based approach yeah. i suppose to, to resale royalties working with the Desert Network, I think, at the time. Yeah, which was a really interesting pilot project yeah. where they, I think they created their own blockchain yeah. and they were looking at um, trying to track um, the sale of Indigenous artworks in a few remote communities. Yeah. Um, so, so, again, using blockchain, not specifically NFTs, though. And the issue from my conversations with them, I wrote a short piece about it, actually, was that the it was the... Um, the galleries themselves were struggling with metadata management in a way that could be reliable on a blockchain, which I think also brings into some of the issues that Lachlan's encountered in, in his research. Like, how do you ensure that all along the supply chain the data is is working and correct? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think how that translates through is that challenge. And I think that connected to what you were saying before was just that, I mean, one of the takeaways from my my research and half of it's anecdotal, which is always fun from an academic perspective, um, is just the, the lack of knowledge or the lack of in, um, awareness that is prevalent in this space. And that's what Eric was touching on before is that, you know, the people in this room have some level of awareness, but frankly, you know, you don't know what you don't know, except, you know, you don't know it. Um, but what's interesting in this space is, you know, the role of um, organisations like Arts Law Australia to then try and promote um, education in the intellectual property domain and whether or not there needs to be some sort of awareness in that space as to encompassing the technological role in this. But I mean, they have their ambit, which is good to increase that. Um, but one of the things I've talked with a few lawyers about is just whether or not there is role for some level of increased pro bono service or something at an entry level to help with tech entrepreneurs to make sure they're aware of the legal ramifications, because all too often um, people in tech, they view that lawyer as the final step that comes after the product instead of working with them from the first day. Because if they have raised capital, they have very rarely allocated capital for lawyers. And that, um, you know, whether the advice costs X amount to figure out if ASIC will come after you, uh, quickly they realize if they get a letter from ASIC, it will cost this much. And um, then they're willing to spend it. But if there's a preemptive advice, that's always ideal. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, there's a question over here, down in the front. Um, while that's happening, um, I've always had questions in my head around how internet like, sanctions and international agreements 
kind of play against each other and what if I'm validator in Australia and the US is um, putting sanctions or, or, or asking for OFAC compliant, uh, say, MEV boost uh, lists so that only certain transactions are validated that are known to not breach sanctions. Um, does that affect me? Like how, what, what are the agreements that I need to know about? How do all of, how does the international landscape play out here? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I might say a couple of things and that Mike has a word as well since he hasn't had one yet. But um, the lot, the, the, the arm of US jurisdiction is very long is what I would say. So they find a number of ways in which to cast the net very wide. And we've seen that in the blockchain space this year. And I think things like the Tornado Cash a action are uh, giving a lot of people a space pause to sort of reflect on what those touch points are. It's also important to ignore, not ignore the fact that there are other jurisdictions out there as well, which also have sanctions regulations. But over to Mike. I think that's Mike? well said, Stephen. <laughs> and the US <laughs> often sets the standard for these kinds of things. One of the benefits we've touted of blockchain transactions is a know your transaction approach that could replace anti-money laundering checks in the future, but there's going to be a rocky road while that kind of comes into play. So it makes sense to look at international rules and try and find what's a safe approach that's going to work in the target market. Um, things are always going to be accessible in other markets as well, but if the primary um, risk can be managed somewhat by meeting a compliance of whatever that bar is, is going to be better for a project. John. Hi. Um, question from community. So recently with Uki Dow and I mean previously with Ripple and uh, I would even say with Tornado Cash, like, you know, Tornado Cash is so bad at anonymizing that like a nation state was not able to anonymize their transactions on it. So like there's none of those protocols I feel like are where I would like to be crowdsourcing our resources to defend them in court. And yet what we see in the US is that the smartest minds um, from the most well-funded VCs are paying lawyers to present amicus briefs on behalf of, you know, Ponzi Ripple and like, you know, non-decentralized kind of, um, you know, derivatives trading, quite obviously illegal insider job at Ukidao. And so as a member of the community, I feel quite conflicted because I don't want us to get bad laws. But at the same time, I feel like there is some contradiction in um, spending resources and using the law to defend these actors who are not representative, I would say, of like the best actors in our community or the things that we are like long-term building. So I'd like to know just your general thoughts about this because it is happening more in the US, which means it will probably happen more here in Australia. Um, and then specifically how you see or how you imagine laws around DAOs um, getting made because we had great presentation yesterday about the model law framework from Koala and I think a lot of people are really enthusiastic about it but I'd like to know your thoughts on how realistic it is for us to get something like that implemented in Australia let's say in the next five years. Thank you. I could jump in on that if you like. Go. For it, Go. I think that when it comes to things like amicus briefs being filed in America we don't get to choose our cases. Um, as lawyers, you know, things come along to us um, and the lawyers working in the blockchain space, particularly in the US, have probably been foreseeing this. Things come up in disputes, that's what the courts are there for, and no one really knows the shape of them. So while many may look at some of these projects and say, well, we don't necessarily like the um, people who are being attacked, there are elements which, if they're decided a certain way, have outsized impacts, which is under that American approach with amicus briefs coming in is, is why people can come in and put in those submissions to say, hey, we're not part of this case, but we think your decision is going to impact us in a way that deserves um, us to be heard. So I wouldn't view them as defending those um, projects as much as defending a principle which they might be worried will go the wrong way. For example, there's been a lot of recent noise about you know, serving parties via blockchain transactions, um, and whether or not that could be good service. And many lawyers have jumped in to say, well, no, that's a terrible idea. It's not notifying anyone. You don't get notified when something arrives in your wallet and you shouldn't be getting a beep on your watch every time that happens because you could get salt attacks and other weird little things that come in and you shouldn't be wasting your time. Um, 
And so it doesn't really matter what the substantive issue is that's being prosecuted in that matter. The amicus is coming in to say you shouldn't be able to be serving people that way. You should stick with traditional methods of service. Otherwise, the concern is those cases will build on the previous decisions that no one's intervened, and then it will affect somebody else who isn't one of those projects. And I think to, this, to your second point, legislation moves slowly by feature, not bug. Um, I think that the space is not sufficiently large that it commands a huge amount of attention from politicians. I don't think it's necessarily on their radar any more than it need, than it needs to be because of problems that have happened. And, and that's very unfortunate because it only, you know, politicians are also reactive when bad things happen and, and bad news is out there. Often that's when the public calls for change and you can end up with um, regulation being made that isn't necessarily fit for purpose because it's responding to an outside stimulus. The only real answer is if the community can push and make noise around good regulation that is going to help preemptively fix problems, that's the path. But it is a multi-year part process to get any kind of legislation in, and there isn't anything really moving to push, say, the Koala Model DAO forward. Uh, it's not something that is on the policy platform of the current government. It was on the Liberal Party's policy platform. So it may well be something which isn't actioned unless and until there's a change of government in the future, um, particularly on the DAO side. I certainly don't think there's been any statements from the current government saying that that's a priority of theirs. And while they could change that, I think their priority is going to be uh, focused much more on licensing of centralized exchanges given recent events. Thank you. We have a question from Robert, then Primavera, and then we may have to take a break. Could I just quickly add something? Oh, yeah, Lachlan, yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, just a really quick thing as well is that um, one thing to bear in mind is that while we may not be having the best representatives being actually decided in court, um, a function and a fascinating thing that Australia tends to do is there's always judges having what's known as obiter decisions, which is basically, to simplify, them going off on random tangents and hypothetically, if the person was like this instead, it would affect my decision in this way. And while that isn't binding, it's still interesting insight. We can still get into what it could have been. Um, and even the decisions we've been seeing so far around crypto, there are those little nuggets in there where they can go off those tangents. So that could be an interesting space to watch. Great. Robert? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so the concept of decentralization seems to play quite an important role in uh, helping define things like liability. Uh, how would you, as lawyers, go about what, what would be useful in helping to define this term that hasn't actually been very well defined at all? Uh, I might take it first and then Mike can add, but um, th so decentralization is not a, a term that's really known in law at, at this point. And so the, the law doesn't really approach it from that context. The financial services laws, if we're talking about that context that we have, are extremely broad and extend to things such as even just arranging um, that can be very uh, tangential to the actual underlying activity itself. I think the, the question is whether or not the as project is going to be sufficiently broadly based such that it can be said that no one is effectively arranging a project. And there's a lot of, uh, I think, work to be done in terms of analysing facts and circumstances to understand what that, that sort of uh, regime would look like. There's a number of different parts moving in parallel here as well in terms of liability, but also financial services laws and how they're responding to the development of blockchain technology. Mike? Mike's gone. gone. <laughs> well, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, OK. We just can't see. There you are. That's right. It was, you know, a screensaver or something. Um, no, I, I think Stephen said it pretty well, then. I don't really have a whole lot to add there. I think it's... Um, it's difficult and a surprising amount of law when you're involved in it comes down to pulling out dictionaries. So there's a huge amount of importance that's placed on definitions and a lot of time is sensibly spent trying to make sure definitions are right because everything flows from that. And it's so early that it's um, going to take a while for all of those um, definitional aspects to come through in a way that will make sense uh, and, and give some predictability to the sector. Thank you. Um, can we get the mic up to Primavera? Who's Oh, she's got one. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I have two short questions. 
uh, or long, depending on the answer. Uh, but the first one is uh, um, for Stephen. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting. Um, and uh, and you say indeed that uh, um, it is kind of strange to try and frap in DAOs. Uh, because that kind of defeats uh, the purpose of the DAO, which I strongly agree with, but uh, I'm curious, uh, well, given that the wrapper seems to be at least one solution to protect uh, members from the liability, uh, ex except in the case of Tornado Cash, which I don't think will, will serve any defense, but uh, then is there an alternative way that DAOs can, can do? Uh, in order to protect themselves for liability, or do they have indeed to defeat themselves in order to actually gain this um, this protection? And then the other question, more generally, is about uh, um, again tornado cash, but more generally on the question of uh, so with Marshad, we, we we recently published an article on the implication of tornado cash for blockchain neutrality, uh, which kind of drives on the uh, early days during Silk Road, where there was a lot of discussion about uh, tainted transactions and whether we should create new clients uh, that are rejecting transactions that have been tainted uh, because they come from Silk Road uh, address. And at the time, it's, uh, it seemed just impossible because, of course, no one will implement and adopt these new clients, and so let's not even discuss about it. But to Today, especially in light of flashbots actually implementing a change in order to respect the offer, are we back into uh, this space in which the discussion around tainted transaction becomes an important dis dis discussion? And do we actually is there is there room for actually trying to figure out whether this is, is this actually good to actually have a system for? Uh, actor to declare those those address are tainted and therefore let's contaminate all the transactions that are stemming from it? Uh, or is it indeed something that will put into question this concept of blockchain neutrality uh, in the same way as network neutrality where a uh, transaction processor should not be held liable for processing transactions just as mere um, intermediary as opposed to the people that are really uh, uh, creating the transactions? Thank you. Two massive topics there. I mean, I think in, to take the the first one about uh, how can DAOs sort of protect themselves. Uh, I think that there's a number of different models that people are sort of searching for at the moment, and there's no one coalescence around one particular model. Is this is the way to wrap a DAO or, or not to wrap a DAO? And that's why I think the work that yourself and others are doing around the DAO model law, I think, is a really important work because. Um, all of the current models are imperfect at some level. And so what we're really searching for is something that fits natively to this type of, of organisation. And I think that's why continuing those conversations are really important. From the actual individual's perspective, um, if you don't choose, it might be chosen for you, I think is kind of the message. Um, and you know that's, that, that might be fine for um, many sort of DAOs that are not doing sort of controversial, difficult, uh, insensitive kind of areas, but in DAOs that are insensitive, areas, I think there's a, a lot more thought that needs to go into to, to how people think about that. Um, the second question around uh, censorship, um, that again, a massive, massive topic. And uh, I think it goes really to the heart kind of, of, of blockchain technology and also the comparison to sort of the traditional uh, financial system. And I think uh, I'm going to kind of uh, take the easy out on this one and say that a lot more debate needs to kind of be had around that and where the, where the rules should fall and where the liability should fall around scrutinising uh, transactions. At the moment, that, like, that obligation is falling mostly on centralised parties, which seems to me quite appropriate. The more fundamental question you're asking is, you know, wh what do we do about validators and base layers, which goes to the point that Ellie was making earlier. And I think um, that's something where at some point we're going to need some le legislative or regulatory clarity. Thank you. Anything to add to that, Mike, or anyone else? Uh, I would only add that Philosophically, I agree with the neutrality perspective that nodes processing data are just processing data. Uh, and I think that historically our anti-money laundering processes and regimes are designed to be principles based at a business level. So uh, the the I, the way that know your transaction can be implemented should be left to businesses to decide and organizations to decide to say, OK, it's not about something has touched a dirty wallet, therefore it's tainted forever, because that would just be silly, in the same way that uh, we do not sample all of, you know, the cafe doesn't sample all of the banknotes that comes through its cash register for traces of drugs um, to, to in, in order to reject that. Why? 
it's very expensive to do so, but it's a lot easier and cheaper to do so with cryptocurrencies to see where they've been. But I think that the practical and useful level of um, any blocking is at that business stage to say, does someone want to take this? Do they think this is too close in their assessment to something which has been flagged on a, on a, an oracle or a list as being problematic um, because of that flow through of, of the way cryptocurrencies work? But it's definitely an education piece for regulators and others to understand um, that simply because you can trace it doesn't mean that um, you can that inferences are correct in saying that something has been um, in a dirty place, therefore it must be dirty forevermore and tainted forevermore. Obviously, we already see social actions on wallets that are associated with the Silk Road and other things being watched and, and people just simply won't touch them. And that just shows how uh, social norms work. Law doesn't need to replace those if they're working functionally, but when it comes to money laundering, there's a long history um, terrible inefficiencies. And so I think any way, any way that can move towards a, a more efficient system that is shown on evidence to actually work. And there's real questions of whether our current system as it operates actually has end results that um, are meaningful versus the cost. But that analysis is really, really important to be done so that policymakers can make a call on whether or not this is actually working and it's being useful and it's supporting um, economic growth while also prevent actually preventing any crime or if it's doing nothing at all question what is what is the usefulness of it but i definitely agree with you at the base sort of layer zero layer one level um it's probably going to take uh, as stephen said some legislative intervention to put in okay this is not something that there should be liability for in the same way that the us have their common carrier arrangements to say that certain carriers of internet information are not responsible for the websites that are being hosted or served up as a result this is a pretty um well-known concept that uh, i think can be easily transported across into the blockchain world but it's going to need policymakers to decide to do that.